Welcome to this edition of Business We Define. The half year season is still here with us and we are privileged to have Moses Mudoi from ABSA, Chief Strategy Officer as well as Finance Director in charge of the Corporate Investment Banking Unit. Welcome on set. Thank you very much. Thank you. Looking at your numbers, I'm really intrigued by your asset quality. Your NPL ratio is in the single digits comfortably and also when I look at the quantum number, you're clearly placing a very tight lead on the bad debt. It almost looks to me like you're in a very different market from other players. Um, I think in banking you always have to read the cycles and potentially read the cycles uh, early enough before they occur. Uh, there's always, you know, first in, last out uh, as you manage through the cycles in terms of uh, portfolio quality. So I think even before COVID, we sensed some stress in certain areas. Uh, we began to tighten a bit on the hospitality side. Uh, we exited most of the airlines uh, uh, assets that we had uh, many years, you know, just, just before COVID. Uh, and on the retail lending side, we began to shift slightly from private schemes uh, to which are probably you know just you know uh, payday based uh, uh, lending uh, to more government schemes uh, that are more certain. And then we began to shift our book more to the secured side, uh, with you know ramping up our mortgages business. But even then, we started to open up for SMEs because we were really underweight in the business banking space, and we began to really open up and secured on that side. Uh, so, you know, when, when we started to navigate through COVID, there was already some, some form of, you know, uh, uh, cautiousness in how we were building our balance sheet, right? Remember, we grew our assets by 20% in 2018, 15% in 2019. So it wasn't really curtailing growth. It was just kind of thinking about where are the right pockets of growth. Uh, I think with COVID, very quickly, we realized some of those calls were the right calls we made. Um, uh, and then we began to look at those accelerated pockets of you know, severe stress uh, that would come you know, a few quarters down the road. Uh, uh, we tightened further on, on hospitality. Uh, uh, and so if you look at our wholesale balance sheet as an example, uh, there isn't a single sector where we are above 7%. So it's fairly well distributed. Uh, uh, so that really, really has helped us. Um, on the retail side, again, uh, we, we began to focus more on profitability. Uh, so, you know, this explosion of, of mobile lending, we kind of shifted back from volumes to value. Yeah. Uh, and our Timiza is now profitable 14 months in a row, even during the COVID period. So we didn't, we didn't, uh, we didn't just open up uh, volume growth uh, without worrying about, about quality. Um, I think the last thing is that we were very decisive with about 60 billion of restructures that we did. Uh, we've seen the regulatory forbearance uh, come to an end, uh, you know, first quarter of this year. Uh, and out of, out of that 60 billion, only about three, three and a half billion uh, 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 you know, has not been fully cured. So, so you know, those have become NPLs, we've fully provided for them because they're stage three impairments. So you're seeing from 60 billion to 3.8 billion, uh, fully curing almost 90% plus of that book. I think net net, uh, I'd say, you know, designing the, the, the economic cycles, uh, being fairly balanced in our portfolio, but also ensuring that we continue lending. And if you remember last year, we lent 103 billion to the economy at gross basis. You know, this year, half year, we are running over half of that amount. So we're not stopping lending, we're just being cautious on where we lend and what we focus on. Just give us a sense in terms of uh, when you look at the book itself, how would you say it is categorized in terms of uh, large business, small business, medium-sized business? And why I ask that question is because there's often a perception that uh, the MSME segment is a main driver of NPLs, but sometimes you go to an earnings release and you're shocked by it. Yeah, so, so diversification is very important. I mean, no less than in banking when you're going through periods of uncertainty. Uh, if there's something we learned uh, from the global financial crisis and indeed the last 18 months of COVID crisis is that a retail wholesale 50-50 diversification is going to put you in a good state. Uh, you know, retail banks always uh, outperform when there's an up cycle. Wholesale banks always outperform when there's a down cycle. Net-net 50-50 gives you a more predictable financial profile. Our balance sheet sits, uh, when you think about wholesale, which is you know, large businesses, small businesses, medium businesses, and the retail, which is the consumer base, uh, is fairly, fairly well balanced. You've seen our earnings today. 
Uh, the wholesale bank contributes 59% of profits in the first half, uh, and the retail bank about 41%, which shows you the power of having that 50, 50 diversification. Indeed, when you look at our NPLs, even though our, our NPLs absolute terms have gone up 7%, in terms of split between, corp, between wholesale retail, it's 50-50. Uh, uh, so again, from an NPL point of view, we are fairly balanced. I think strategically, running a bank that has got that diversification uh, uh, provides, provides that cushion, uh, no matter the economic cycle. I think the question becomes within the pockets of wholesale, where do you accelerate, where don't you accelerate? Um, uh, we are absolutely focused on growing our business banking, small businesses segment. Our wallet share is not where it needs to be. Uh, uh, our corporate business is quite sizable. Uh, there are pockets of growth, but there are risks there. On the retail side, uh, 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 always focused on smart growth, you know, driving and secured for profits, not for volumes. So you're going to see us run a 50-50 uh, strategy um, uh, through, through the coming quarters and the coming years, I think. I thought um, the loan loss provision was significantly slashed, especially considering the 7% the uptick you've just mentioned. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So last year, uh, we took 9 billion of credit provisions in payments. Uh, about 4.6 billion of that was portfolio quality. You know, you impair loans that need to be impaired. Uh, about 1.8 was single names uh, on the large corporate side. And 2.6 was overlays we took deliberately to position for what we thought was going to be quite uh, a subdued uh, macro environment. We didn't have to take the 2.6 billion because these were overlays on, no, on performing book, not the non-performing book. Uh, so as we've seen the macros and run our models in the first quarter and the second quarter, what we had assumed, whether it's unemployment or currency or inflation or GDP, uh, we had taken a very conservative view. Uh, the outcomes are quite different. We've released about 1.5 billion of the 2.6 uh, this side of the year. That has left us with about 1.1 billion to release looking forward uh, based on where the macros go. So there's that, there's that impact. I think the second impact is uh, portfolio quality is absolutely, in terms of new vintages, absolutely within our expectations. Uh, the leads we put last year, the conservativeness has helped year on year on an underlying basis uh, to show reduced impairment. So on a loan loss ratio basis, we are at 1.8%. Uh, that's perhaps where we were in 2019 pre-pandemic. Uh, uh, and I think that's the levels perhaps we we'll need, we'll need to run at. So it's, it's sustainable when you think about it uh, in those terms. Speaking about your appetite for the mortgage business, why that is, is of interest to me is because uh, the real estate sector has been hit. Even prior to COVID, we're, we're witnessing a bit of a lethargy and sluggishness in it. Um, how then do you ensure that your risk profile on that side is uh, well calibrated? Yeah, so I think the pockets of uh, the mortgage market, the residential mortgage market, uh, that are sweet spots. Uh, you, you've got to study, you know, the, the mortgage market indices across different stratums, right? Not the entire collective. Uh, we're clearly not big in uh, commercial property finance or commercial mortgages or lending for, for commercial uh, uh, real estate. Uh, and, and I think that has been severely hit if you look at the numbers. So we don't have, we're not carrying any excesses on that side. On the residential side, um, first we've got to look at our customer base uh, and ask ourselves, you know, those who've serviced different asset classes uh, uh, on time, on budget, across the cycle, uh, and, and probably have you know, solid businesses or uh, continue to be employed. Uh, um, and you look at our book where it sits today on mortgage and you think about market leaders on the residential mortgage side, there's clearly a gap for us to go. So, so the book is not where it needs to be. Uh, we are building it. Uh, we are cautious on how we, we diversify our risk and the pockets we pick. Uh, I think the, you know, the very, the very um, um, sort of middle market uh, uh, there are challenges in there. I mean, you've seen the rolling in, in house prices and the rentals coming out of that and therefore serviceability of debt from whoever's borrowed uh, to, to kind of take, take those assets in the middle market. Low market, huge opportunity, top end, some opportunity. Uh, just fairly balanced as we, we, we read the cycle in the residential mortgage market, yeah. Government securities and interest income from that side, I noticed a 7% dip. What's happening about that? Is it about the softening of the yield curve or what's playing out there? Yeah, I think strategically, uh, we have to always be cautious to, 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 to meet the social contract of banking, as, as sometimes uh, uh, I'd like to call it, which is you've got to lend to the consumer. I mean, that's the only way the economy is going to recover. Uh, so we always have to balance 
where do we shift the power of our balance sheet, right? I mean, it's good to get the yields uh, and ramp up your available for sale portfolio, uh, almost you know, run your margin risk-free, you report higher income. What about the consumer side? I think, you know, what about small businesses? So there's a deliberate effort to balance between, for the funds we have that we've been entrusted with, uh, how do we balance them between you know, consumer lending and lending to the government? Uh, that's number one. I think secondly, there are sovereign risk limits. Uh, uh, we are part of a group. Uh, the group has, v has views around sovereign risk across across uh, the continent. They're quite positive about Kenya from a sovereign risk point of view. So we always often look at those limits and ask ourselves, where do we want to run in terms of our, of our sovereign, uh, sovereign risk limits? Uh, I think going forward is going to be a fair balance between how you oscillate from you know, your deposits to either customer assets or they're available for sale. Uh, which one tapers off at what point, given the yield environment. Uh, we're quite deliberate. Uh, I think we're likely to see some probably uptick on the available for sale. Uh, but over, over the cycle, and, and as we think about the medium term, uh, absolutely growing our customer asset base and lending to the consumer and to businesses is going to be of more importance. Let's talk a little bit about your non-funded income. First is that uh, I noticed the income from uh, foreign exchange trading just flatlined. Why is that? Well, so I think if you think about last year, uh, uh, what we report under that number, uh, there's incredible volatility in the currency market last year, particularly in the Q3 side. Yeah, absolutely yeah. right. Um, and 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 our market's business is volatility dependent, right? So when volatility is heightened, uh, you'll see some one of big revenue items uh, come through. I think that's been uh, subdued this side of the year, uh, uh, the first half of this year. Uh, very comfortable with the price stability we are seeing, uh, uh, not much volatility, not major tectonic news like COVID is here and therefore you know, currency, currency fluctuations uh, that we saw. So there's, there's obviously, the environment is a bit more stable uh, and that's one. Second, I think is just trading volumes, right? Um, yeah, every time trade volumes uh, either stabilize or reduce, uh, clearly the fiat of those volumes from an FX point of view is also subdued. So the trade volumes um, uh, are probably you know, steady and stable uh, from rapid increase quarter one last year. Uh, the real impact of trade volumes was in Q3, not even in Q2. Uh, this year we've had two quarters uh, of, of just steady, not, not significant uh, trade volumes. And that, that's what's happening there. Again, it's a cyclical business. Um, uh, our, our markets business, which is you know, currencies, uh, derivatives, uh, brokerage uh, has been a market leader for, for, for a long period. Uh, we just have to manage it through the cycles, yeah. Okay. yeah. And still on the NFI, um, I think one of the sweet spots in these earnings was uh, just looking at it as a, as a share of the entire revenue pie and now sitting at about 33%. My question is, uh, what's your target and uh, how, f how far do you think you can push this envelope in terms of that diversification? Yeah, so, so thanks. I, I think first of all is just to recognize the, the nuance between this year and last year. Uh, we think like, we, we, with items like fees from digital transactions that were there in the first quarter uh, that are not there you know, this year. And even within that environment, we've seen our NFI go up 6%, uh, despite, you know, despite uh, uh, you know, the regulatory forbearance uh, 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 persisting in terms of you know, fees you can charge for digital transactions. We've really been on a deliberate effort to diversify our NFI sources. Uh, we have a very solid bank assurance business. Uh, you know, we tend to see clients underwrite risk when there's a down cycle, so insurance businesses tend to do well. Uh, we've seen clearly significant growth in our insurance business. Uh, we have a brokerage business uh, that didn't exist um, uh, you know, two, two and a half, three years ago. Uh, that, that brokerage business is sub substantive now. We launched our asset management business uh, this part of the year. Uh, and I think with Timiza, the fees we get there, all these things have supported uh, NFI to grow despite uh, some challenges of some revenues entirely disappearing. Uh, uh, I think that 3% is, is a good level. Uh, um, probably as we build and diversify for the future, you know, we see this philosophy of smart growth being growth that is less dependent on capital intensive uh, pockets of our balance sheet. 
Uh, I think regulat regulation in terms of you know, capital and, and risk weighted assets and the advancement of Basel, all these things are going to make uh, uh, you know, capital such a, a very, very scarce resource. And where you apply it and the return you get from it and the risk you run on it, all these things will be important. So we will continue to push the envelope on the NFI side. 33 sounds like a good space to be for the first half. Uh, we hope we can improve on that going forward. Your cost to income ratio, I mean, your rationalization is clearly evident in your numbers. And looking at where it's sitting now, I think it's in the mid 40s. Uh, just how, how, how far do you want to push this again? Yeah, so, so again, thanks. We're pleased about the efforts we've put around efficiency. Um, that number used to be mid 50s, uh, close to 60s. We navigated through the rebranding period with one of expenses that pushed it uh, to the 50s. Uh, um, we were very keen to make sure that when we come off the rebranding, we'll see a convergence between the published number and what we used to call the normalized number uh, to that below 50. We're very pleased to be at 45%. I think it's a function of a number of things. One, revenue is growing. Secondly, we've dealt excess capacity that the business has had from 2013 uh, to date. Uh, thirdly, uh, one of expenses are behind us. So that mid 40s is sustainable. What that tells you is, uh, just to answer your question about as we think about the future, if revenue is going to continue growing, which is our plan, and the cost to income ratio uh, sustained at mid-40s, the absolute cost will have to slightly perhaps go up. So, so the plan is to reinvest uh, that, that additional cost into revenue growing uh, initiatives to keep uh, the, the level of mid 40s cost to income ratio. Uh, we think mid 40s is again a good space to be and if our revenue continues to grow as opposed to driving it to below 40s uh, uh, where again you begin to question uh, whether you know your operating leverage is, 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 well, is well managed uh, at very low cost to income ratios. I think reinvesting and making sure we stay at mid 40s while revenue grows up is, is perhaps strategically the rails we want to run. I looked at your cash flow position and the liquidity that you're sitting on and I thought, um, did a dividend have to wait for the full year really? Uh, when you have shareholders who are anticipating something given the kind of results you've put out? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a very good question. Uh, you know, we always seek to assess the ability to pay dividend based on whether our capital position can afford it or not. And uh, the first half, we have 13 billion of you know, cap capital buffer. Uh, uh, so fairly, fairly a very good question to ask. I think we have to weather the quarter three uh, and see in quarter three and quarter four you know, what outcomes come our way. Uh, I think if, if the outcomes remain within expectations, uh, we'll reassess uh, resumption of dividends uh, at the full year. Uh, but we are comfortable on capital. Uh, we just have to be cautious that we're still very much within this pandemic. You know, no one knows what's going to happen with the fourth wave or where vaccination rates will go, whether we'll end up with more severe or less severe uh, lockdowns and what that would mean in terms of uh, uh, extending you know, uh, forbearance to our customers again. So these are known unknowns. And I think uh, as you're managing through the financial calendar and the financial year, perhaps you're most certain at the end of the financial year to make a call. Uh, so so we, just, we just have to wait for quarter three and quarter four uh, and see what call we make at the end of the year. Let's now talk a lot more regarding the banking sector. First question is whether you have received any guidance from the market regulator regarding the issue of uh, pricing. It's been an ongoing conversation. Any update from your side? Yeah, so I think uh, the conversation is ongoing. Uh, very much collaborating uh, with our regulator. Uh, I think, you know, we have nothing to report at this point in time. Uh, but hopefully, you know, we, we get to provide uh, an update once we get uh, to, to a very, you know, farmed up uh, guidance on the way forward. Uh, I think we are, we are very much pleased with the conversations and, and the openness and the support uh, we are getting from, from the regulator. And I think it's an industry conversation. Uh, and we just have to wait and see where this goes. We are very optimistic. Um, I think everyone wants uh, to really uh, see credit uh, growth in the private sector. We've seen 7.7% growth in the first, you know, in the first part of this year. Uh, we think that number will go up. We have, banks have to be there for the private sector. Uh, we have to continue extending the power of our balance sheet uh, to lend to the real economy. Uh, and everyone is very much within that same spirit. Okay. I'll, allow me to push that conversation a bit because um, in view of the risk profile out there, there's a lot of concern in terms of what this um, protracted period in terms of the negotiations is having in terms of impact on banks. Are you 
extremely bothered by that, not bothered at all? Do you think um, we can still carry on like this? I think we're still growing. Uh, you know, as I said, we grew our assets 2018, 20%. Uh, 2019, 15%. If you compare this year and 2019 pre-pandemic, we're still growing. Uh, and that growth can only uh, happen if you're lending. So we're still lending, you know, from 103 billion last year, gross lending to the market. As I said, this first off, half of the year, we've, we've lent more than half of that. Uh, I think there's still pockets to continue lending and, and to continue doing so profitably. Uh, so I don't think there is necessarily a handbrake. Uh, of course, one has to uh, uh, evaluate whether you know, you can accelerate much faster, but I don't think there's a handbrake uh, to our growth and how we lend to the economy uh, because of you know, the conversations that are ongoing. Okay. Yeah. In the recent past, we've seen a lot of um, M&A activity right. with uh, the big players in this market going to markets such as DR, Rwanda, Tanzania as well. Is ABSA lining up something of the sort in the pipeline or um, what's your near-term outlook looking like? I think M&A really just makes sense in terms of what is your strategy, right? Uh, consolidation in market, existing market, or expansion to new markets. Suddenly, uh, uh, we are very comfortable with the runway we have to grow our business organically uh, within the Kenyan market. And I think regionally with our group, we have significant presence. Uh, we are part of a solid, uh, sizable, scalable bank with 12 trillion shillings uh, of assets across, across the continent. We have two banks in Tanzania, one bank in Uganda. We have the Kenya Bank. The Kenya Bank is 400 billion in assets. The East Africa combined operations, quite significant asset base. Uh, uh, so from a group point of view, because we have to operate within the group context, we're in the markets we need to be. Uh, I think we've got to think about uh, our strategy within the group from, you know, what must we buy, but what can we build or where can we partner? Uh, so building capabilities and partnering for capabilities perhaps for us makes more economic sense than buying a capability uh, within the Kenyan market just more, more specifically. Let's talk about the asset management uh, venture. And I remember sitting down with Jeremy um, early this year and my question was, uh, don't you think the timing could be inauspicious? Because, I mean, look at how the market is. And um, looking back, how is it performing? What's your assessment? Yeah, so I think it's early days. Uh, this is the second quarter, uh, having launched our asset uh, management business. Um, I think there are two sizable opportunities that we see when we look at the market. There's the institutional side, uh, which is fund management for pension monies, endowment funds, foundation funds. Uh, clearly a huge, huge, uh, uh, you know, huge, huge pool of funds, you know, 1.4 trillion out there being managed by fund managers. Uh, so we see, we see ourselves having, you know, hired very, uh, very, very solid fund managers uh, to join us uh, penetrating that space. I think the other side is value add on the retail side, um, where you begin to introduce uh, investment products uh, to the more sophisticated retail customers or more simpler unit trusts to your less sophisticated retail customers uh, doing onshore and offshore. So there's a value add to clients. I mean, clients want it. Uh, they need it. Uh, it earns us a return. So it's the right thing to do. On the institutional side, uh, we'll penetrate it as we go. Uh, but the plan is to continue driving those two sides of uh, our asset management business. Very early days to share any numbers, uh, but we'll be looking forward to discussing more outcomes uh, in the coming quarters. Yeah. Right, and that point by Moses Mudui takes us to the close of our conversation where we have been focusing in part one on the results which have just been released by the bank and in part two touching onto issues regarding the banking sector. Stay tuned to Business Redefined for more coverage on these issues.